today we're beginning a new series in the Gospel of Luke, and uh, we're going to be preaching through this thematically. So we're not going to touch on every verse in Luke, but we're going to go through it thematically. And one of the themes in Luke is God's faithfulness. So we talk about God's faithfulness, we're going to talk about his love for the lost and his vindication of Jesus. Those are the three main themes of Luke, God's faithfulness, his love for the lost, and his vindication of Jesus. And so I invite you to follow along in your time in prayer and scripture. Uh, There are scripture journals on the info table if you would like to grab one of those and read through the whole Gospel of Luke. But those are the themes we're going to touch. And we're really also going to look at it through the lens of the word for the year, which is renewal. We talked about this last week, about being renewed this year. That's what God wants for us, is to be renewed. It's been a tough couple years, but we want to be renewed. And the goal of this series is to give us a renewed certainty in the covenant story of God, fulfilled by Jesus, who is Lord of all, so we can take the gospel, freedom of the gospel to all. That's a big thing in Luke, that Jesus is Lord of all, and so the gospel is for all. And so Luke is, a, is part one of a two-part series, Luke and Acts. And the author Luke is writing to someone named Theophilus. And why does he write to Theophilus? Check out this. The reason he writes to Theophilus is in verse 4 of chapter 1, that you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. Certainty. What was likely happening is that Theophilus, he's a Gentile Christian, he's experiencing or seeing affliction among Christians or towards Christians. And he's possibly seeing division between Jewish and Gentile Christians. And his question is, is Jesus still the Lord of all and is the gospel for all? Is what you, I've been taught true? And Luke, what Luke wants to do is to give him certainty that despite what he sees, hears, and experiences, it is true. Jesus is Lord of all, and the gospel is for all. So kids, teenagers, are you having trouble believing that Jesus is Lord of all the past two years? When life's been up and down, things have been canceled, basketball games, soccer games rearranged, and seasons canceled, school's in person, and oh, whoops, now it's virtual. Sunday night, they email you, tell you it's virtual this week. Is Jesus still Lord of all? Or maybe you're struggling, you've been, you've struggled with the way you see yourself, or the way people see you, or how you talk to yourself, that inner voice, teenagers, that inner voice that tells you you're not good enough. Or you hear how other people talk about you, that you're not good enough. Are you having trouble feeling certain that the gospel's still for you? And what about the rest of us? We have those inner voices. We have those things people say about us and do to us. Are you struggling with believing that Jesus is Lord of all and the gospel is for you and me? Yeah? Well, guess what? In the first century, they were struggling with that. So it's to be expected that the 21st century, we would too. See, we, re, we need renewed certainty that God's long story, his long told story is true, that Jesus has fulfilled that story, and that Jesus is Lord of all, and the gospel is for all. That the gospel is for you, it's for me, that Jesus lived the life we should have lived, died the death we deserve to die, and rose again from the dead. That is all true, and it's still true today in the first century and the 21st century. And that means the gospel is for all. And today what I want to talk about is that, the, that God cuts through the mess of our circumstances to prove his faithfulness. And we must respond to his faithfulness with trust and joy. When I read this story, I couldn't help but see how God cut through the messy circumstances of first century Israel, first century Palestine. And what he wants from us is to respond to his faithfulness with trust and joy. And so I want to talk about those things today, the challenge of faithfulness and how faithfulness must be anchored in a faithful God, and faithfulness must be a response of trust and joy. So before I dive in deep here, can I, would it be okay with you if I just like geek out on first century Palestine for a second? All right, you're here anyway, so I'm going to do it. All right, but in first century Palestine, times were really tough for God's people, 
And although the Jewish people were back in the promised land that God had promised them after the Syrian and Babylonian captivities, they still felt like and they often talked like they were still in exile because things were just not right. So instead of being exiled in an oppressor's land, now the oppressors are in their land in the Romans. And even though the temple had been rebuilt, and although it's beautiful and massive, they actually actually estimate there was about 25% of all Jerusalem was the temple. Could you imagine if Liberty Northeast was 25% of Philadelphia? You would have like north, west, south, northeast Philadelphia. Right? Northeast Philadelphia would be like, and from north to the east would just be all us. Right? That'd be incredible. Maybe that should be one of our goals. But the temple being rebuilt, it's beautiful, it's massive, but the problem was it was rebuilt and finished by Herod. And Herod was a puppet king for the Romans at best. And he wasn't an heir of David. So it was an imitation. It wasn't a real temple in people's eyes. And not only that, in the, when the, Solomon built his temple, there's this great story, this great picture of the glory of God descending on the temple. But when the second temple was finished, God's glory doesn't descend. And because of this, the people, for the most part, saw Herod's temple as a poor imitation of Solomon's. And then on top of that, There's significant division across theological and political lines. Sound familiar? There's groups within Judaism. Some people, scholars have referred to it as Judaisms. There's Judaisms in the first century. Jewish people were sitting around there waiting for God to show up, for him to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and to free them from the Romans. But there was this disagreement about who would be vindicated and who would be condemned when God showed up. Like, who's going to be on God's good side and who's going to be on God's bad side? So they started to form groups. So first, there's this one group called the Essenes. The Essenes, they left Jerusalem. They wanted to get away from the Romans and Roman culture, and they saw the temple was fake. It was imitation. Let's just get out of here, and let's go into the desert and form our own community. And and if you ever watch the History Channel, that's called the Qumran Community. And they are responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we didn't know much about them until the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered by a little kid actually. And then there's the Sadducees. The Sadducees had this kind of like, can't beat them, let's join them, right? We can't beat the Romans. We're not powerful enough, so let's join them, right? So they're invited to like all the prayer breakfasts. They're there in the White House. They're the, they're, they're the pastors. They get invited to everything. They're the priests. They get invited to everything. Because why? Because they have so much power by being close to the Romans. So they say, hey, we can't beat them. Let's just join them. And when God comes, God will see that we were faithful to who he put as king for us, Caesar, and he will vindicate us. And then, of course, there's the zealots. The zealots have a can't beat them, but let's try to kill them anyway mentality. And if you know anything about the Romans, they do not like zealots. And so crucifixion was the way they showed they did not like zealots. And then, of course, there's the Pharisees. Pharisees might be the group you're most familiar with if you have a church background. The Pharisees hated the Romans. They even funded zealots, and they wanted to make sure that they were purified. They were so purified from the Romans that it was clear when God showed up, he would see the distinction. And he would see the distinction, and so what they would do is they set up all these overbearing rules to maintain a clear distinction from the Romans. But to, so all that, you don't have to remember any of that. Just remember this. Everyone was frustrated. Everyone was angry. No one was satisfied. It was a mess. And it's this mess. This is the mess that God decides to send his son into. If I'm deciding to send my son into anything, it's not first century Palestine, pre-toothpaste, pre-indoor plumbing. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's angry. Romans are in charge. But that is the mess for whatever reason God decides to send his son into right in the middle of the mess. See, God likes to work in the mess. You might think your life is too messy for God, but God only works with messy people because messy people are all that there are. You might think you're jacked up, screwed up, messed up, but that's the only people God works with. 
And if you don't believe you're that, you are jacked up, screwed up, and messed up. And you need God even more. But the question is, how can you be faithful to him while life is a mess? So look at verse 26 again in chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. See, since the start of the pandemic, I feel like we've lived in a cloud. It feels like this cloud has loomed over us, right? There's new names for whatever variant is coming or has come, and we were trying to figure out, like, do you have Delta or do you have Omicron? Which one is it, right? It's just kind of this cloud over everything and everyone. So every time you turn on the news, what do you see? You see the case number, the hospitalization number, and the deaths number are on the screen. And then you'll hear about somebody famous getting sick and dying from COVID. And for a while, it's felt like, for me, at least, like COVID was something out there. It was something that, like, no, I didn't, for a while, I didn't even know anybody who had COVID. Then I got it. And I didn't know anybody who's been hospitalized. Then my friend was hospitalized. And I didn't know anybody who's hospitalized. And then my aunt was hospitalized. I didn't know anybody who died from COVID. And this week, one of my loved ones died from COVID. It started to hit home. The cloud is moving closer and closer. Someone's always sick. Someone's hospitalized. Someone's not going to make it. Someone needs a miracle. And I know we do these like fun semantic games where like the people die with COVID or for COVID. And while the rest of our world is like trying to have that semantics game to make them feel, feel better about themselves, since February 2020, the U.S. has experienced over 900,000 excess deaths. Almost a million excess deaths. It's like we have a cloud that follows us. A cloud of death, a cloud of pain, a cloud of agony. It just hovers over us. It's responsible for shutting down our favorite restaurants or our favorite stores. Or it's responsible for moving our school to virtual again. And this cloud has made our world a heavy, dark, painful mess. So how can we be faithful to God while we're still in the mess? And the way to be faithful is that our faithfulness must be anchored in a faithful God. And so we jump back in, look at verse 28, and the angel came to Mary and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. We can't be faithful unless we cling to the one who's always faithful. Renewed certainty is attached to God's faithfulness. We don't know much about Mary. We actually don't know anything about her up to this point in chapter in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1. All we know is that she's a virgin and that she's been betrothed to Joseph. Betrothal in the first century was, a t- was stage one of a two-stage marriage process. So stage one, you kind of get this like legally binding engagement, right? There's no like you have this argument and then the woman just like throws the ring back at you. Like it's legally binding. So you get engaged, you're legally bound to that person. There's witnesses there. There's a price that's paid for the bride. And at that moment, the woman becomes the groom's wife, but she remains with her parents until a year later, stage two, they get married, they have the celebration, and the husband brings her home. And we aren't told how old Mary is here, but betrothal could happen as early as 12 years old. Like, our 12-year-olds are like playing Fortnite and going to school. These 12-year-olds are getting married. Well, my wife and I, we just had our 15th year anniversary. We look back at our wedding pictures, and we're like, we're 22, 23 at the time, and we're like, who let those babies get married? In the first century, they were letting babies get married. And so Joseph, who's of the house of David, this is really important because the house of David, that means Mary and Joseph's child, whoever this is, will be a legitimate heir of King David, unlike who? Herod. And that she found favor with God. Mary found favor with God. Was there something special about Mary? Did she do something to find favor with God? No. God chose her because he chose her. That's it. See, God doesn't choose the special. He specializes the chosen. 
Christians often look to the most special in the world's eyes to accomplish God's plans. We look to the celebrities who profess faith. We look to politicians who profess faith. And we're like, if those guys are out front and they're doing things, God's plan for our world and our country will happen. But it's the people who seem the least special that God uses to accomplish his plans. Abraham was a pagan wanderer when God called him. Moses was a disgraced murderer when God showed up at the burning bush. David was a scrawny, dirty shepherd when God made him king over Israel. And you look at the rest of Luke 1, which we won't go over today, but Zechariah is just an average priest doing the mundane job of being in the temple when the angel came and announced the birth of John the Baptist. Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, was a poor pregnant woman who's the first to prophesy about Jesus. And a baby in the womb, John the Baptist, is the first to leap for joy at the coming of the baby in the womb, Jesus. See, God doesn't choose the special. He specializes the chosen. And so we keep reading in verse 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, she's just asking for more information, how will this be since I'm a virgin, right? It's a legitimate question. How am I going to have a kid if I never slept with a man before? And the angel answered her, check this out, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, pause a second. If you have a church background, you just heard those words because you've heard them a thousand times. Think about that. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Jump down to verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said what? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary has nothing to offer here. Absolutely nothing. But God, because he's faithful, enters into the mess of the first century world to fulfill his promises to his people. Because God's faithful to his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to make a great nation of their family, because God's faithful to his promises to David to establish his kingdom forever and put a person on the throne forever, he sends his son Jesus to rule over the house of Jacob and to sit on David's throne forever. Mary's only asset is that she's open to be used by God. That's it. Young people, in the first century, women were treated as second-class citizens. They weren't men. So here's God choosing a second-class citizen in the world's eyes. She isn't a man. She isn't rich. She isn't privileged. She isn't powerful. She hasn't even slept with a man yet, but God uses her to carry his son in her womb. And it's in this situation, it's in this mess, God decides to do the impossible in and through her. It's not her faithfulness that God gave her favor, gave her favor with God. It's God's, favor, God's faithfulness that made her favored. She's not favored in herself. It's, she's favored because God has chosen her. And all God is asking her to do is to be faithful in return. See, in the mess of life, God's not asking you to be the perfect candidate. He's not asking you to have all the answers. He's not asking you to be privileged or powerful or rich or the most gifted. He's asking you to be faithful. That's it. And I've had to tell myself that time and time again throughout the, pan the highs and lows, particularly the lows of the pandemic, that God's not asking me to be the best or have all the answers. He's just asking me to be faithful. And if he called me to plant this church, he'll make it happen. I just need to be faithful. So if the church has four people, 40 people, 400 people, he's asking me to be faithful. God is just asking you to be faithful. To be open and used by him, however you are, 
with whatever you have, wherever you are. God's not in love. Listen to me. Look at me. God's not in love with a future version of you. He's not in love with a past version of you. He's in love with the current version of you. And he wants you to be faithful now, however, with whatever, wherever. Don't say, well, at some point I will be faithful when I have this. Young people, when I was 11, I was serving in my church. 11. What if I wait and say, well, when I plan a church someday, then I'll be faithful to what God's asked me to do and serve. I'm 11 years old, and God has built, prepared me for that time, for this time, by starting then. I remember Reverend Herb Lusk, he used to play for the Eagles, and then he became a pastor, and he, he told this story, I, I remember it distinctly, he, where he learned to be financially generous before he became an Eagle. So he was making what he said was about like $10,000 a year. And he was making about $10,000 a year, and although it was tough, he decided to start giving to God then. This was before he was an Eagle, he's making He's giving 10% of $10,000, $1,000 a year to God. And then he started making $100,000 a year. Back then, they didn't make the millions of dollars they did do now. He started making $100,000 a year. And guess what he found? He found it was harder to give God 10% then more than it was when he made 10000 Until God convicted him, and he said, Herb, I could go back to allowing you to make 10000 a year if you want, if that's going to make you faithful again. So Reverend Lusk talks about how he then quickly was like, no, 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 Lord, no, Lord. Like, no, I don't want to make 10000 again, Lord. I'll start giving and I'll start being generous. See, Reverend Lusk realized that he had always wanted more, but the more he had, the harder it was to give. So don't say, I'll be faithful then, when I have X, Y, and Z, when I have that much money, or I have more money, or I have a better job, or a nicer house, or I have more friends. Whatever it is, don't say, I'm going to be faithful then, because then might be harder. Then might be messier. God wants to form you now. He wants to use you now with the skills, talents, and abilities you have now, with the story, the hurt you have, the ways you need to grow now, in the job that you have now, with the family you have now, with the finances you have now, at the stage of life you're in now. I don't care if you're 11 or 81. Now God wants you to be faithful now, not then. He's not in love with some future version of you because it's not you who makes you worthy. It's not you who makes you special. It's not you who makes you favored. It's God who does these things and out of his faithfulness alone that he chose you. And all he's asking for you to do today is to be faithful. Not then, now. Because the Bible says, choose today who you will serve. Because unless you come to terms with that, God's faithfulness and his desire for you to be faithful now, and that it's God's faithfulness, and God, it's God who makes you favored, and it's God who makes you worthy, you'll either become arrogant or self-deprecating. You'll either think that you're worthy, and therefore God is lucky to have you on his team. And that will lead you to arrogance. Or you'll think that you're so unworthy and because you don't have special talents, you can't play guitar, you don't like to speak in front of people, you don't have these certain skills or abilities now, God tolerates you being on the team. And that will lead you to be self-deprecating. See, but that only happens when we put our hope in ourselves rather than God because we realize that it's not me who makes me worthy. It's God who does. So I am not arrogant in thinking that I am worthy and God's lucky to have me. And I'm not self-deprecating because I realize, yeah, I'm unworthy, but God still uses me anyway. It's not, it doesn't matter how gifted you are. At some point, those gifts will wane or they'll be useless in the mess that you're in. And you'll end up disappointed because your certainty was in you. And for those of us who feel unworthy all the time, 
it doesn't matter how many times Barney the dinosaur tells you you're special or that your teacher tells you you're special or mom and dad tell you you're special because if that specialness is rooted in you and not God, you'll always feel disappointed. But if we put our faith in God's faithfulness, who's always faithful to bring about his promises, who chose the virgin's womb, who sent his son to die for our sins in the mess, who raised him up from the dead to bring us into a relationship with him and each other. And all we have to do is to respond in our own faithfulness by first repenting of our sins, and at which point, that, at that point, God makes us special. He specializes us then. And then we live faithfully, however, with whatever, wherever, in response to his faithfulness. And when I do that, when I realize it's God's faithfulness, not my own faithfulness, I'll never be disappointed. Because it's not about me matching up. It's not about me being worthy. It's not about me being faithful, as faithful as possibly can be. But it's about God's faithfulness, his worth, his glory. And that Jesus matched up for me. And so we'll respond in faithfulness. Our faithfulness will be a response of trust and joy. So look at Mary in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Our faithfulness must be a response of trust and joy to God's faithfulness. Could you imagine what it would be like in the mess of your difficult circumstances where you could see God's faithfulness in it? You see how your life would change if your, your life was rooted in God's faithfulness and not yours? It would look like what Mary does. It would look like worship that I'm trusting in God's faithfulness to his promises. I'm not trusting in myself. It's not me who makes me worthy. It's not me who brings myself glory. It's not me who makes me favored. It's God who does those things, and I trust his faithfulness, and I respond with joy in the middle of the mess. See, when you realize it's God's faithfulness, you respond in joy. You're not disappointed. You respond in joy. What would it be like for Christians or people like at Liberty Northeast to be known as the people who responded to the pandemic with trust and joy? What if people didn't want you around, not because you're spouting conspiracy theories or you're throwing out junk science, but because you're annoyingly joyful? Like, what if you were the person, what if Liberty Northeast was like the people, every time they saw us coming into Wawa, or they saw us coming into restaurants, or they saw us coming, you coming into work, and like, oh no, here they come. They're going to be way too joyful for this moment. What if you're the person who's always walking around saying, hey, don't worry, God's got this. Or you said, hey, hang in there, God's in control. Not as this like Jesus juke that we do to kind of like get out of like serious things, but as things that are true. What if we're people who said, hey, I heard you're really going through it. Let me cry with you. Let me weep with you. Let me mourn with you. But I should warn you ahead of time that I'm not going to weep, cry, and mourn as somebody without hope. Because I have hope in Jesus to redeem this situation. Or if someone came up to you at work and said, hey, how's your day going? Instead of complaining, you said, hey, I actually can't complain. God's good. No matter how your day's going. Or they say, oh, man, did you hear what the president did? Blah, blah, blah. This is what he did this week. Aren't you so angry at him? And you just said, hey, man, he's just human like me. He makes mistakes. Plus, dude, I don't trust in temporary kingdoms. I don't trust in his kingdom. I trust in the eternal kingdom of Jesus. So yeah, he's going to make mistakes. His policies are going to stink. What did you expect? He's human. He's not Jesus. So no, I'm not angry. Oh man, if you were that person, you'd be so annoying. (laughs) But the point isn't to be annoying. The point is to be joyful. See, if you trusted in God's faithfulness, and you learn to be faithful however, with whatever, and wherever, man, you'd be insanely joyful. No matter what happens. So hey, let me challenge and encourage you as I close. First, I want you to trust God's faithfulness. 
my challenge to you is to be faithful however, with whatever, and wherever, and be insanely joyful. So when I pray to close out the sermon, I'm going to give you a moment to just apologize to God for the ways you aren't doing that. For believing that God will, I'll be faithful then, but I can't be now. And let me also encourage those of you who are just in the thick of the mess right now. God sees you. And he's not asking any more from you except for you to trust him and to be faithful. But he sees you. And although trust and joy might not come easy or right away, rest in the fact that God sees you and all he's asking you for to do is to, all he's asking you to do is just be open and faithful. Because God cuts through the mess of our circumstances. He jumps into the mess to prove his faithfulness and all he's asking us to do is respond to his faithfulness with faithfulness of our own trust and joy.